One of the things I always like to do is give you real case studies. And of course, that's one of the reasons why I sometimes show movies, because there it gives you a much better idea of what these case studies really are like. And so as far as population ecology is concerned, I want to give you several cases of how populations and environments interacted with one another and what the results of it were. So the first of these is the story of the red cockaded woodpecker. And one of the things that happened to the red cockaded woodpecker is that there were biotic factors that were modified. Now these are biotic factors that were to a great degree modified by us as humans, but nonetheless it's modification of the habitat that created a problem for these woodpeckers. Now, it almost became extinct because of some of the practices humans enacted, and it wasn't really obvious that we were doing anything particularly wrong. All we tried to do was to uh, work on fire suppression. Fire suppression means that when there is the chance of a fire, you make sure that the fire doesn't happen. That's really what you try to do. And so you enact, uh, you, you know, you, you put Smokey the Bear on the side of the road and says the risk for fire is high. That means that fewer people are going to be dumb enough to make a campfire or fling their cigarettes out into the bush than if Smokey the Bear wasn't there. Right? So you try and, and create a way to not have fires. The problem is, in some regions of the country, fires are actually a natural habitat occurrence. And as a consequence of having fire suppression, it changed the forest floor vegetation in the habitat of these woodpeckers. Now they need open flight paths. They, they want to be able to fly rather quickly through the forest and they want to be able to see. Well, if you have a lot of undergrowth now that's growing up because there hasn't been a fire that's gone through for some time, then the woodpecker isn't going to be able to fly where it wants to and it's not going to be able to see where the food is. Clearly those are problems. People then said, okay, well, these woodpeckers have now become almost extinct. We now know why. Why don't we fix it? So what they started to do is work with controlled burns. And these controlled burns are actually very useful because they do provide training for the fire department. They are allowing the fire department to engage in environmental management, which is an, a, a new dimension for a fire department, and this all worked out very well. So here you see the red cockaded woodpecker, and it basically has the, the nests in these, in these uh, pine trees. Here you have the example with all this undergrowth, and this is a place where the woodpeckers cannot thrive. Now you have the controlled burn reducing the undergrowth and you end up with a clear flight path. And so here you can clearly see there's a lot, it, it looks a lot more spacious than it did there. And so controlled burns turn out to be important for these woodpeckers. So that was a way by which we understood how the individual organisms dealt with their environment. We realized the cause of their decline and we were able to fix it. And that really is a great example for how environmental policy can work. It even created jobs for people in the fire department to do these burns. And it was just an unreasonable fear for the natural types of fires that occur periodically that caused this. So once people understood, okay, these fires aren't a big deal, in fact, the environment may need them, then it was okay. So it, it needed a little bit of education and the, the management, the willpower to enact the management program. A not so successful story is that with the North Atlantic cod fishery. And one of the reasons why this was not so successful is because this made a big impact on the economy. And when you throw money into the mix, when you throw money into the mix of how humans interact with the environment, then most of the time, up to this very moment, the environment is losing. And so when you look at what happened to the North Atlantic cod fishery, you, you have a really good example. All right, let's start you in on this. If you have a nice and stable population of cod, that would be a population that is following a logistic growth curve. 
then it would reach a carrying capacity. Now, if you want to fish, then you can, as long as you fish only to the point where you bring the population back to where it will grow back very quickly. And the fastest growth of any population occurs at about half the carrying capacity. So if you take the, the fish stock in the North Atlantic and you catch a whole bunch of these cod and you make sure that you're not going past half the carrying capacity, then the cod in their normal environment will start to grow very quickly back to the level of the carrying capacity within one or two seasons. I mean, it's, it's literally, uh, people have shown that it's a very quick recovery time. However, if you go below that, then you threaten the sustainability of the population. If you go much below this half the carrying capacity number, then you're not going to be at a stable growth rate you're not going to reach back, get back to that carrying capacity, but in fact, you're going to reduce the population to where it is no longer able to recover quickly. So harvesting is okay as long as you don't violate this sustainability number that half the carrying capacity is. Now, if people realize this, then of course they should implement these policies. And no matter what happens, they should not go past this number. Because if you are interested in the longevity of a fishery, whether it's cod, whether it's sardines, whether it's tuna, whether it's anything, once you drop below that level, then you threaten the very existence of that fishery. So rather than having long-term sustainable use of that resource, you cut it off and you have nothing. Now, there are a lot of people who like to be fishermen, and that's, their, that's their, uh, the, their way of life, and that's what they want to be. And if just somehow they catch too many fish, they lose all that, then that's obviously not the right kind of policy. So just to eke out the extra buck during a certain year means you're going to destroy the fishery forever. Well, that sounds pretty... Uh, pretty strange. It does not sound like a good strategy. But that's exactly where we found ourselves. So, population ecologists have figured this out. And the people who make these policies were advised by the scientists to figure this out. But then the policies were not adopted based on these sustainable standards. They were basically adopted to ensure that the fishermen vote for the politicians who interact them. See, this is where this voting comes in again. Uh, there was a, a very interesting development just early this year where the House of Representatives, this is our House of Representatives, they passed a resolution, and this resolution says that the Environmental Protection Agency should not have any scientists on the panel that determines threats to the environment. But instead, that it should be only members from industry. So here is a panel, the scientific panel no less, the scientific panel of the Environmental Protection Agency, which is the kind of agency that would come up with these kind of data and recommendations. And we, as a House of Representatives, are going to decide that let's not have anybody on this panel who could actually tell us what's really going on. Let's only have the people who know about the industry numbers be on this panel. Because, so, so the, the saying went, people who are in science, they don't understand industry. And after all, we want more